subscribed welcome back my darling and if you have not yet subscribed please do subscribe and join a part of the family and while you're down there subscribing because I have faith that you will also turn your notifications on for all notifications and become a part of the Morgan Shay notify the gang 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 so upon your all's request you guys requested for me to return the beauty and documentary breakdown a series that I had on my channel back in the beginning it was something that I was very I've always been very much into true crime and makeup so I thought combining the two instead of talking about um, different crimes that are going on there are so many different gurus and people on YouTube who do that I thought let's do a, tw a twist a spin if you will and do documentaries and upon that I ran a poll on my Instagram and you guys requested the Night Stalker so me and my husband started watching it and the way that I've decided to do this is to break it up between the episodes that way we can really dive into the documentary so, number one, this is going to be a huge spoiler alert for the Night Stalker episode one. Um, again, this is the Night Stalker, the hunt for a serial killer. And this is going to be only episode one. Before we even get started, I want to put a trigger warning right here, right now. And this is for, you know, if, if you're going to go watch the documentary, if you're going to listen to this, whatever. It is extremely graphic, and we are going to be explaining and breaking this documentary down. So, if you're triggered by anything to do with rape, murder, anything to do with that, graphic details of a crime, you know, all of these things. We're going to be talking about the details of a crime scene, like all of these things. So, if any of these things are harmful, hurtful, hard for you to watch or hear in any way, please click out of this video. There will be other options, as always, linked up in the cards for you to go watch. Let's go ahead and get into The Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, Episode 1. As always, y'all, products will be down in the description box. So, off the rip in this documentary, we are introduced to Gil Costello, um, and he's going to be in this documentary all the way through. He was one of the homicide detectives. You learn in the, from the beginning. He's letting Los Angeles know, you know, hey, there is a crazy man out. Um, he li literally doesn't care what gender you are. He does not, I mean, and this is what was blowing people away. People were scared because there was no like, Oh, well, it's, you know, only young women. Oh, it's only brown-haired women. Oh, it's only men. You know, it wasn't like that. This person would literally kill anyone, like it was random. So, in the beginning, right after you see, you know, uh, Gil Costello, you know, on the news, it's like a news imagery, and you see all of these people from Los Angeles on the news and you know they're talking about how terrified they are there's even one lady who says I don't even care if it's my son like I'm not letting him in like the fuck he can sleep on the streets like I'm not leaving my door unlocked for anybody at this point you get introduced to Gil Costello you learn a little bit more about him how he you know where he was raised you learn that you know, he was getting in a lot of trouble, hanging around with the long, wrong people. And one day, somebody knocks on his door, and his mom answers the door, and the person at the door says, hey, if you want your son to quit messing with this crowd, sign this paper. He goes to the Army. When he gets out of the Army, he, you know, ends up going to school. He becomes an officer. And at a very ripe young age, he was put into the homicide department, which made him the youngest in that department at the time. Costello's on the homicide department. And in the mix between Gil, like talking about all this, there's also a lady. And I thought while she was talking, I thought, oh my gosh, her glasses, she had like these red heart glasses on. And I thought, wow. That's a look, sis. Um, but she's talking about how she would go on her lunch break. She would go to the thrift store. 
and just kind of like look around or whatever, like, you know, nothing too serious. And this one in particular day, she noticed an ACDC hat. So she walks over to the ACDC hat, picks it up, and she was like, you know, I don't know what that means. It's like 1985. And uh, she's like, I don't know what that means. So she sets the hat back down. And then she notices this very strange man walk over, pick up the hat, look at her and smile. And she said that it was a very like creepy smile that he reminded her of like a killer clown. He was missing a lot of teeth and it creeped her out. So she doesn't really think any more of it. She goes to head home at the end of her day and she's on the freeway and she notices this car that just starts to like race up on her ass. And so she gets over in the other lane like to get out of his way, like what the fuck? And he comes up behind her and slows down to her speed and looks at her and smiles. And she said it was like the creepiest smile she had ever seen. And he was wearing, she noticed that it was the guy from the thrift store. So fast forward after that, this is when Gil Costello says, you know, he gets a call with his partner to go to Rosemead, California. They get there and the garage doors open. They get there and as soon as they walk into the condo, there's blood everywhere. It's, it's, it's insane. And as soon as he walks in, he notices this ACDC hat that's laying on the ground. So boom, here is the first part of evidence that they have. And as you watch the first episode anyways, because we're talking specific to episode one, you will learn that Gil was very intelligent. Like people would laugh off things that he said all of the time. Dale Okazaki was found laying on her back in the kitchen floor. Um, and she had, of course, passed away. And what's important here and what Gil points out is, and he, he's really good at this, and you will learn that in the documentary, like he's really good at like observing the crime scene to like the fullest capacity. And he notices her handprints. So she was like ducked over, she had groceries. So she was like ducked over and she heard something. So she put her hands on the counter to kind of look up and seen him. And this is important to the documentary, and this is something that Gil does point out, is that this killer wanted to see his victim's fear in their face. He could have very easily done it before she even looked at him, but no, he waited. He wanted to see the fear in her face before he, he done the act. Maria. Maria is gonna be the next one that we talk about here. She was the roommate to the suspect inside the home, and she was in the garage, and she started to hear a noise, and so she turns around to look, and she sees a man in a members only jacket with a gun pointed out straight across, like pointing at her. And so she puts her hands up like this. Y'all, of all the luck in the world, of course, the gunshot knocks her down to the ground. He goes, he goes on into the house, and she, he actually hit her keychain. He did not hit her. So she was still alive. And so she starts to run down the street in a panic. And so she hears a gunshot inside of the condo and she fears for her friend. So she goes through the front door thinking that the killer would go through the garage door since that's the way he entered the condo. No, he was walking towards the front door. She walked inside. And so she just like put her hands up and was like, you know, whatever. I mean, there's nothing I can do. And he put the gun down and turned around and walked the other way and left her there. And this is where Gil starts to create and remember a theory that a college professor had told him about how some people who murder, they get off on the fear in people's faces. Um, this is very, and you know, it's almost, it's a sexual thing. So it's very common in rapist, um, to, they get off on the fear in your eyes, the fear in your face. So because Maria was so like, just completely still in that moment, it wasn't, that's not what he was wanting. That wasn't, that wasn't the vibe he was needing. So he just turned around and walked away and gave up. Now, something that is mentioned in the documentary is this, at this point is that the Maria's mother was actually a neighbor to Gil growing up. So at this point, this case becomes close to home. It becomes personal 
for him. And I think that's what gave him, not, not the only thing, but I think that that's a big part of what gave him like the oomph to like figure this shit out. 45 minutes after this murder, you find out in the documentary that in Monterey Park, another murder had occurred. 45 minutes later, after this one happened. And this just further proved Gil's thoughts because this was a young Asian girl who was driving and she was kind of like hunched down to their thoughts, like looking for something. And she, he banged on the hood or the top of the car. And so she was startled and looked to see who it was. And he drug her out of the car, continuing to kill her. And this just further proved Gil's thoughts that he wanted that fear in the person's eyes. He wanted them to feel that fear. He wanted to see them very fearful. And I thought that this was sick, but also very interesting. I've never heard this before. So I thought, wow, like that's a sick, 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 person. Also at this point in the documentary, you do find out that it was the same caliber weapon that was being used, a 22. However, Gil makes it known there that like that wasn't something that caused him to like tie the two together. He said because there's so many different like 22s, like there's no way that they could be like, oh yeah, they're tied together. But the, you know, series of events, the fearfulness, the guilt. Like I said, Gil was just very intelligent and I think still is and just started to tie this story together. Gil is not, you know, thinking these are tied together in any way. Um, but he does go ahead and have Maria because, you know, she was left alive to give a description of this man. And so Gil takes it to the station and one of the guys at the station was like, Gil, hold on a minute. It was an identikit drawing and he, br he brings it and they put them together and it looks like the same guy. Now the issue with this drawing is that this was an attempted kidnapping that happened out of the city of Pico Rivera. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So this would mean that these murders that were happening the person, the killer, the, the serial killer at this point, who was committing these murders was also con committing kidnappings and was not murdering these victims. These were going, you would later find out that these are going to be children and they would be left alive. And Gil would be laughed at over this. People thought he was nuts because it was something that had been unheard of at this point in criminal history. There hadn't been someone who would go and just kill anybody. Like everybody was a target. There was not like, you know, one person is, you know, one person safe because they have blonde hair and this bit, you know, the serial killer is only killing people with brown hair. Like it wasn't like that. Male, female, doesn't matter, like any gender, any race, like it does not matter. So he was laughed at, he was a laughing stock because of it. 10 days later, there's another one, Whittier County, and this is a brutal one. This murder is absolutely brutal. There is another investigator who has been introduced to the documentary, Frank Salerno. And uh, you would later, you know, figure out how he's tied to uh, Gil Costello. Um, but Frank speaks on this murder in Whittier County and he says, you know, this was brutal. He had stepped on a five gallon plastic bucket to get into the home, like crawled through a restroom window to get into the house. And this home was ransacked. They show pictures of the actual crime scene in this episode and it was ransacked. Like it was a freaking wreck. There was also like a over $40,000 worth of theft that happened in this home that night. The male victim was executed while sleeping on the sofa. This 
whole murder also would involve a 22 caliber. And this would be the Zazars. So now you have uh, Tyson Yu, you have all of these people who have also been murdered with a 22. So this is when Gil is like, his wheels are really starting to turn. Like he's really starting to add and put like the puzzle piece is starting to make sense. You know, like when you're putting a puzzle together for the first little while, it may not make sense, but there's that one piece. Once you put it in the puzzle, things start to make sense. And this was that for Gil. Now, the female in the Zazara murder was, I mean, when they said it in the documentary, me and Chris, my husband just looked at each other like, oh my God. Like y'all, it was absolutely brutal and I'm not gonna repeat it. I'm not gonna repeat it on YouTube, but if you watch the documentary, you'll understand. Um, I mean, it was absolutely like, I've never heard of someone being, you know, stabbed there. I will say on this one, like, he literally like cut her eyes out of her head. Like, it was just absolutely, like I just could not even imagine like that being the way that she went. And Gil made an interesting point here. Like he liked the fear in his victims faces, but was Miss Cesara, was she giving him a look like memorizing, like giving him a look of almost, you know, past fear and just complete anger? I mean, that kind of makes sense, you know? Smoking gun in this case, something that happened that changed the game was a shoe print. So remember I told you that he stepped on a bucket to get in through the restroom window? Well, he left a, he left a shoe print and that would be a mistake. At this point, this is like a really hard part for me. Um, to, it was hard to watch, it was hard to listen to, and it's hard to talk about. But there's a woman that starts talking and she talks about how, you know, she was six years old and um, obviously now she's grown, you know, this was in 1985, but she starts to talk about this night when she was six and how a man had come into her room and carried her out and she said it almost looked like someone in her family. So she didn't really like think anything of it. She was six. So she just went along with it. And she gets put in the car and he asked her to look in the glove box. And so she looks in the glove box and there's a gun in the glove box. And he says, just know that that's there. And she was like, okay. And she said they end up get into a location, he has her get into a duffel bag. Then they go into this home and she says when she gets there and she's out of the bag, she starts to look around and realizes, you know, this is like, she said it was really dumpy, it was really gross. There was a lot of like random food left everywhere and it was just gross, it was disgusting. And they kind of show an image in the documentary of like what the place looked like. And she also said that Madonna was playing in the background. She remembers Madonna distinctly playing in the background um, like a virgin. And y'all, I think you can put the pieces together of what this sick motherfucker did to this little six-year-old girl, but he did. She would ask to go to the restroom. He would take her. Um, and then eventually she said they got back in his vehicle and they were... They stopped at a red light and there was a gas station across the road. And he said, go over there to the gas station and call nine, have them call 911. And so that's what um, she did. And because, you know, when anything happens to kids, that's an entirely different, like, that's a whole different department. So Gil and them, they weren't, the homicide department people, they weren't getting this information, right? So, this information wasn't being like, it wasn't something that they were actively like investigating, you know, it was a whole different department. 
So at this point, you know, there's all of these abductions of these children that is coming up all over the place. So in this, in the same area, in the same, you know, LA, obviously, cause these that we're talking LA here, uh, they say, you know, we're in a different department. However, when you're investigating anything, you keep up with anything, any type of crime that happens, you take note of it because it could possibly involve your suspect that you're looking for. In comparison to the drawings that Maria Hernandez had given earlier, when looking at what the children, like how they described this person to look like, it was very similar. And so they start to think, okay, that's odd. You know, this is something we should take a look at. But Gil was like, no, these, these, these go together. They were saying the same things like light skinned, Mexican, Caucasian, very tall, missing teeth, a pungent odor. Like these were all similar details, all of them. What Gil is automatically like, boom, we have a serial killer here who is responsible for killing um, men, women, also, you know, raping children, girls, boys, it doesn't matter. Like, we've got a situation. Gil ends up attending this meeting, and it has to do with, you know, there's a whole bunch of different criminal units there, um, but the child abduction unit is there. That's like the main reason for the meeting. And Gil brings it up. He starts to think that all this is linked to these murders that he's investigated. And he's basically laughed out of the place. He's literally laughed out of there. Like, they're like, no, like it had never been, it had never been notated before. It had never been documented. This had never happened before. And you know, history repeats itself. So that's just how people are in history as itself. Like if it hasn't already happened before, people are just not down for thinking that that is what's going on, you know? So people just weren't, they weren't ready to listen to Gil's, to what Gil thought was going on. Like they said in the documentary, you know, you just don't have someone who is violently, you know, taking the lives of people, but also, you know, doing these horrible acts to children, but then letting them go. It's just not something that you've ever heard of. So a friend of Gil's calls him and says, hey, every time you walk into this, anytime you walk into the office, anytime you walk out, people are like making fun of you, laugh, like you're the laughing stock. And he also has one person who was like, I think you're right. I think you're right. And so Gil was like, I'm, I'm, this is how, like, this is what is going on. Okay. You people can listen to me or not, but I'm going to save these, like, I'm going to save from more and more and more and more people, like, getting hurt, getting killed. But then at this point in the documentary, um, Gil talks about how he used the LA depart, um, LA department, like home as his home base. And so he's walking in there and some officers approach him and say, hey, these girls just called in to the police saying, you know, this guy's following us. Here's his license plate number. The guy was tall. He had long, dark hair. He was a light skinned Mexican. So Gil is like, oh shit, you know, here's our guy. You know, he's being weird to these girls. And these girls are saying like, this guy is a freak. Like, you know, he would follow one, they would lose him. He would go to another parking lot. And remember, these girls are following him. Like, he's not following them. These girls are like, they got away from him. They start following him. And he's pulling in all these parking lots, like, waiting for these girls. You know, just whoever. Like, it doesn't even matter. Like, he just picks a girl and starts following her. She gets away. He goes and gets another one. So, Gil gets security footage, and he's like, okay, I think this might be my guy. I think this might be him. They arrest him, take him in, put him in a lineup, and Maria Hernandez, two out of three times, like, doesn't pick him, like, and so Gil's like, shit, that's not him, because she would definitely know, like, she said that's not, that's not him. Now, before Maria Hernandez, you know, she thought, well, that could be him, 
And so they get a search warrant to this guy's house, go to his house and they find all of this weird stuff, like a bunch of pictures of women cut out. They find, you know, women's panties with like, the vagina cut out of them like they find all of this weird stuff and then they would do the lineup for maria hernandez and she doesn't pick him anytime like it's 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 not the guy so next we've got the doys and the officer who was called out to the home was the one officer that I mentioned to you guys that like believed Gil that like you know called him and said look I believe you you know we need to we need to look into this so she was called out to the home of the doys and she said it was bad it was destructive it was like a horrifying crime scene and then this is another one where the serial killer would you know kill the husband and then go and take advantage of the wife sexually and, you know, murder her as well or as he thought. And actually the husband, Mr. Doy, would actually save his wife's life by before him actually passing away, dialing 911. This case used thumb cuffs on Mrs. Doy and her thumbs were like ripping, like bleeding profusely when you know 911 got there and she had ripped her thumbs apart in like her like rush to try to escape so gil gets a call from one of his detective buddies at the monterey police department and he says gil i think i've got like your missing piece i think i've got you know what you need to tie these two together and at the kidnapping where uh with one of the children at the construction at a construction site there was a boot print. And Gil's like, oh my gosh, this is it. So he calls the uh, like main like sergeant and the sergeant's like, whoa, well wait, you're looking for a size 12. This was a size 10. And Gil's like, no, it is a size 12. Like I'm looking right at like it's a size 12. And what had happened was the officer, like this is just crazy to me. The officer who had like, was doing the work on the case, he had just like put his foot like over the mark and said, oh, well, you know, my foot covers it, so it's a size 10. He didn't actually measure it. That could have been like destructive to this case, like what the actual hell? So here we go, we've got the link now. And even though Gil had a little bit of circumstantial evidence here, it still wasn't enough. So May 1985, the two detectives who talk through the entire uh, first episode anyways, um, they both just coincidentally like lose their partners. Um, one of theirs retires and I can't remember what happened with Gills, but his either moves or something happens with his. So Frank Sorello literally goes to Gil Costello himself and is like, I want you you know, are you free? And so Gil's like, oh, well, I need to think about it. You know, freaking out, dying inside that. Because Frank, Frank Sorello was like the homicide detective. Like he was the detective. So, you know, uh, <laughs> Gil goes home to his wife and is like, oh my God, babe. <laughs> like I can just imagine the conversation like, oh my God, babe. The biggest detective in the homicide department is dying for me to be his partner. And so he goes back the next day and Frank is like, hey, did you make up your mind? And Gil's like, fuck yeah, let's be partners. Let's do this, homie. They then do like these little interviews with different um, like news anchor people. And they were like, you know, it was nice to have Gil with Frank because Frank was very much like the one that was like the firm hand, like the one to like be down to business. And Gil was a little bit more like loose. So they were very happy to have like Gil there. First case with Frank and Gil together was Patty Higgins. And this one was like overkill. This was very much overkill and reminds me a little bit of Jody Arias, which is 
Um, I do have a documentary that I'm going to do on Jody Arias because, as I told you guys, I've written a paper in regards to Jody Arias. So that's the doc a documentary that I do plan to do. Um, but if you are familiar with the Jody Arias case, then you know, like, that was overkill to the fullest extent. And that's what this was. As the killer of Patty Higgins had not only slit her throat, but then stabbed her in the same spot. I just, oh my God, just like so fucking evil. Just a few miles from Patty Higgins, days later, they get another case, and this is the Cannon case. And very similar to Patty Higgins was the way that uh, Mrs. Cannon, her throat would be done as well. It was like, similar and the thing was is this murderer would wear these like gardening gloves every time because they get another call and at this one they can see like the hand like not the handprint but it was like a bloody like glove handprint and this is just a few miles from the cannon residence and that was the thing, like they could never get anything other than like a shoe print because this person was very careful to not leave any prints, like leave these gloves on. And at this home, it was a 16 year old and Frank talks about how hard it is to like sit down and interview a 16 year old who's just been through all this and like she was beat with a tire iron and all of the other things and I just couldn't imagine that shit, bro. I could not imagine that fucking shit. Gail talks about how they didn't even go in the room where the assault happened. They just waited, you know, in the living room because they didn't want to contaminate anything. And he said one of the women who were there, you know, taking photographs like a forensic, forensic analyst or something like that, she comes out and she was like, hey, there's something in here that you all want to see. And she holds up a sheet and on the sheet there are comforter there is a bloody footprint matching the same and frank looks at gill and is like tell me everything that's going through your mind right now and throughout all of this even though they weren't all his cases whitney bennett being this most recent and all the other ones gill had everything like notate like gill was like on it from the beginning and he was keeping up with all of this information and he gives it to frank and frank is like okay well, now it's in front of me, you know, he says in the documentary, you know, quote, now it's in black and white, like, there is no, you know, once it's in front of you, there is no saying, oh, well, it might be, or something like, like, this is it. You know, of course, when Gil said that it was all one man, nobody listened, but Gil says, you know, once Frank got on board and said, yeah, it's one man, at that point, it was on from there. That's all that the, you know, sergeant needed to know was that. Frank was on board and Frank believed this and this would change the game. They say in the documentary right then, this is when everything started to change. This is when they knew we've got a serial killer. We've got a serial criminal here. We've got to get on it. And that would be the end of episode one. All right, y'all. I hope you guys did enjoy the first episode back of Beauty and Documentary Breakdown. Again, this documentary is going to be broken up into four parts of each episode. So there are four episodes on the Night Stalker. Um, so do be sure that you do watch each episode before the breakdown. That way we can have our discussion um, in the live chat. I will announce it on social media, but always with Beauty and Documentary Breakdowns, I always do live chats. That way we can discuss it as the video goes through. Um, so Beauty and Documentary will be now uploaded every single Wednesday. Um, so yeah, uh, let me know. What did you think of episode one? If you've watched it, what did you think of the breakdown? All of the things. Do keep in mind if you haven't watched it yet and you do go watch episode one, please keep in mind that it is very graphic. It is intended for those of the mature audience just as these Beauty and Documentary breakdowns are as well. Be sure that before you do leave that you do subscribe to this channel and go down in the description box and follow me on all sources of social media. Every different social media 
um, that I'm active on is linked down below. Also, there is an email for you guys to communicate with me on. It is questions, the number four Shay at gmail.com. If you email me there, I will respond whatever you want to. It doesn't have to be questions. It can be whatever you want to. A bunch of you guys have already reached out to me to that email and I love communicating with you guys. Also, be sure that you do turn the notification bell on for all notifications and become a part of the Morgan Shea. Notify gang, 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 gang. And yeah, you guys, I love you all so much. And until next time, bye.